to get the Cliff Notes version for all of us who missed your presentation. Okay. What did you yeah, want I'm people to take? To hear First this of all, as well. what was the title of your presentation? A scientifically driven solution to enhance cannabis production, and I say with confidence and precision. And what I think about and how I structured this was kind of holistically uh, conceiving the whole grow operation, the whole grow environment in terms of an ecological uh, ecosystem. Right. You know, and in nature, which was my training, and I didn't think I'd ever do anything besides natural ecology as a microbial right. ecologist, yeah. learning about plant micro interactions, and I did a lot of climate change studies where we look at the environment. You know, this is traditional ecosystem sciences. Well, I love taking that concept and putting it into the grow room. And I tell everybody, you know, there's only one thing you have to control in precision agriculture, and it's everything. It's everything. <laughs> you know, exactly. it starts with plant genetics, it starts and stops with plant genetics, and then I, I give this 11 parameters for success. You know, and the very last one I talk about, the very bottom, is soil microbes. You have energy, and you have temperature, and you have airflow, and you have humidity, and you have CO2, and you have oxygen in the rhizosphere below ground, and hydrology, and, and root temperature, and nutrients, and then, and then there's microbes. And the fascinating thing about it is, is treating that as an interaction of ecology. And you better understand what all of them do, and if you tweak anything, you're gonna to have to change everything else. Because it affects. Yeah, yeah. and, and I, I, so this, you're gonna appreciate this. You know the typical phenotype formula, P equals genetics, uh, plus environment, plus that interaction of genetics times environments, plus a standard error variability over time. I present that in my talks in terms of precision, uh, precision agriculture, because right. it's basically the same thing. Right. You start with genetics, and then the E uh, is everything else. Everything, including yeah. nutrient inputs, and you have to dial in all those things. So this is a huge bucket and then dialing in that interaction right. and making sure those right genetics are right for your environment because not all genetics are meant to grow up here. Right. I talk about yeah. that. So Because there's the all... photosynthetic equation too <laughs> that comes into it. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, conceptually, the, the, the growers that are newer are like, ah, oh, it's beautiful and kind of yeah. daunting because you're like, oh, I have all this stuff. <laughs> but once you know the picture, you know the buckets that you can start working on. Yep. And then I kind of transitioned that to talk about the importance of microbes playing that very, very small part in that ecosystem, which is a huge part. And I talk about some of the challenges in nature and nutrient use efficiencies and how you can actually maximize the success of plants. And I kind of talk about how, you know, as a matter of fact, no plant in nature exists without plant microbe interactions. Why is that? You know, they support the success of life. And I talk about the human microbiome, how we know now microbes support all our health the same thing for plants and every other life. And so you put microbes in the concept of, of that bigger picture of cultivation, and then you understand how we can start formulating microbes with precision and confidence uh, so growers can use these in precision agriculture settings. So you know what they do. We're talking about targeted function. We're talking about efficacy. We're talking about things like shelf life also, all these things. But if you can do that, and then you can show the results not only from a scientific point of view, from a microbial ecologist point of view, if I started like realizing my purpose and impact of bringing nature and natural processes to agriculture, but we're doing it sustainably, not only because of the nature of bringing nature to agriculture, but because we're doing it profitably. And you can't do a lot of things with success in the market unless you bring profit to your end user. But if you can align profit with sustainability, you really have a true sustainable yeah. technology. And so that's kind of the, the big picture of the talk. And we go into a lot of details about, and data, and you know, our publications. And so it's about fitting that one soil microbial piece into the puzzle that's probably of everything else in that, in that ecosystem is not necessarily well understood. It's more and more understood. You talk about the living soil concepts. I just went up uh, to the lift show in Canada and you know, who doesn't have a million square feet up there now? I mean, literally almost every grower I went to, it's a ridiculous. And some of those facilities are turning the whole million into a living soil grow. I'm like, what? That's awesome. I can't believe it. And that's changed very, yeah, it's changed very, very quickly. And you're an organic grower. You understand that until you understand, it's not like plugging synthetics in. It's a little bit of a process and a learning curve. 
and you can reap the benefits and rewards on the back end if you can go through that learning stage. Right, yeah, and get to know, yeah, what you're working with and, yeah, how to put it all together, like you were saying, and all the little factors, I feel like everyone assumes, oh, yeah, it's just so soil microbes, they just put it in there. And it's like, yeah. well, what does each one of those microbes do specifically in yeah. your soil biosphere? What other microbes or bacteria is that interacting with that's yeah. causing this to happen? And yeah. it gets very, yeah, intricate. And it, it, and, it, and it's harder to measure because they're, they're microscopic and so you're looking for responses right. when you're adding and so you really have to have confidence with manufacturers and make sure they've done their diligence and you still have to be diligent and do your own diligence as a grower. Right. But I put it in concepts of things that you can measure. Like think about if you turn your grow room temperature down 10 degrees or up 10 degrees, do your right. plants respond to that? Yeah, most definitely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> or if you change your light, you know, does that change everything from a low intensity to high intensity? A high intensity, yes. Or what if, what if you double the CO2 in a room? Yeah. What happens? You have to change everything else. Yep. Well, the the microbial component is the same thing. There's a little more finesse, and microbes don't help with any of those macro environmental conditions. You have to get that right. right. But it allows younger growers to fix a lot of problems if there's some nutrient lockout and really add that component, which isn't as measurable, except for on the back. And we see significant increases yeah. in quality and yield, and you can maximize what I think, the phenotypic potential of the plant, because you're maximizing the overall plant's potential to be healthy right. through those right, healthy rhizosphere interactions and nutrient uptake. Yeah. And then we've also talked to many growers who are completely maxed out. They've dialed in the room perfectly, and there's that one missing component. And also it's that catalyst just to up it to the next level. And they're not seeing the same delta or increase in yield as the newer growers, but they're getting that extra 5% that they never thought they could achieve. Right, they're getting that little bit extra. Yeah, yeah, and that, that, that top 5% is a hugely difficult percent to get. Because right. they're really pushing the plant and being right. uh, precision. And so I love thinking about using nature and natural processes and microbes in general with precision. Right. So it's a new concept. Yeah, to bring them together to create something that is far superior than anything you could create before that. Yeah, yeah. So I geek out on it. You can tell I'm yeah, pretty passionate no, about it. No, it's awesome. I mean, yeah, microbes rule the world. Yeah. Microbes and bacteria rule the world. It's absolutely true. Have you ever done any research or has anybody on like light and microbes? Because I think of like sunlight and then indoor lights, and then I also think of light affects the plant, which exudes, you know, to, to it sends out sugars to attract the right microbes, but then also certain microbes react to sunlight, right? So, so I, I don't think about that latter part as much as I think about that first part. And you think about the response you can't measure anything directly, and it's very challenging because you're dealing with microscopic life, but if you can improve the energy and the resources, you're gonna improve the photosynthate, and if you improve that food source, increase a food source, squirt it into the rhizosphere, priming, basically sugars, you're gonna maximize or improve and increase the microbial diversity, the microbial activity, and so you have to measure that over a period of time. I, just, I wrote some papers early on, was, uh, it was called, I called it BPMI for the study, and it was called Visualizing Plant Microbe Interactions, where I had four different grasses and an invasive grass, cheatgrass, and I did an infield experiment and a greenhouse experiment. And over time, we would look at how different grasses, this is an example, in the same environment, the same climate, might differentially influence their rhizosphere microbiome. And the hypothesis was that maybe cheatgrass, which is an invasive grass that's taken over the U.S., it was planted naturally because it was a fast growing grass. And it turns out like every other biological transplant that it wasn't that great of an idea because it's too aggressive. Yeah. It dies quick, you know the story. But I thought maybe cheatgrass as a hypothesis is even more successful because they can nurture a specific rhizosphere microbiome right. to enhance nutrient cycling to make them more competitive. Right. And so that was the basis of that study. Yeah. And it turns out, the, the study supported that. It's a published in Soil Biology and Biogeochemistry. And that's an example where we just start thinking about the plant by itself and these different cultivars or species being able to influence that. And it's very difficult to measure that because you have to measure it over time and it takes a lot of finesse, a lot of methodology, and, and we're equipped to do that, but it takes a lot of destructive harvesting also. So it takes a real experimental design to get to that resolution and a lot of it's correlative. 
And so the questions uh, you, uh, actually initiate tons of hypotheses, and the research isn't very well established yet on those exact mechanisms. Just like any other ecology system, you know, we should do plant microbe interactions in a whole series of global climate change experiments where we would have rain out and we would have extra rain and we have heating pads and CO2. In this space study in Wyoming, it was awesome, super geeked out. A lot of money went into that trial. Yeah. Figuring yes. out all the different variables. And then you have to measure all these variables separately and put them together in modeling, and then modeling is fluing this together, and there's yeah. a level of error. And so there is such a huge road ahead of us and really understanding how those interactions, and that's the biggest challenge. A lot of network, a network analysis is a new tool that comes up to ha allow us to understand more real time what those responses that you're talking about, Peter, are. But tying those together is a very challenging thing for scientists right now. Well, how about this? You guys have an R&D capability. What in the past, let's say, four years are some of the things you've researched and what were the results? So that's a great question. And here's, what we're, here's where it distinguishes, at some point, a fundamental research program and applied research program. And we had to bridge the gap, and it's a very painful thing to do for any scientist. You know, you want to ask questions from the very beginning and follow it through all the way, and you're never going to get to the end of what really matters. You make these assumptions that, oh, I saw this little mechanism early on in planting, and then you make this bold statement in academia. And so that, of course, is going to lead to increased plant health quality and yield, but you're not measuring often plant health quality and yield. And we realize at the very end when you talk to farmers, and farmers want to see plant health quality and yield data, yeah. that if you're going to turn your science program into an applied science program, you better provide that data for the farmer. And you do that by completely flipping your train of thought and you you take a leap of faith that what you're doing is, is interacting with the plant the way you think you know it is from your expertise and years of study, but you measure plant health quality and yield. And then you start reverse engineering what those mechanisms are and you measure a couple along the way, but the details are very involved and it takes a lot of time and a ton of resources. And so we more focus on early on, now on our early research programs, the needle that moves uh, the influencer uh, hurdle for farmers. If we have a rooting agent, for an example, or a microbe that we think is gonna instigate rooting, there's a lot of mechanisms into that. Yeah. But what I want to know for sure is this rooting increase. And you know, I can measure mechanisms in a thousand different samples and never get to that. But if you measure a thousand samples for increased root growth, and then you find that increased root growth, and then you say, okay, what's happening here? And you start making hypotheses there and measuring certain things in the next study. And you know, we've just had this this huge R&D team for the last 18 months. And we're talking years, five year studies Well, you actually. just start spider webbing off in all ah. these new directions. And it's like, well, this is happening over here and this is going on at the same time yeah. over here. We should probably both look at both of these yeah. and see what happens. And then it takes that, the, then the fundamental aspects of the science kick in. Yeah. And, you, and then, then as a co-founder of a company, unfortunately I'll be like, wait a minute, we have our metric for success. We can't understand all the mechanisms right now we have a company, we have a scientific company, and we're measuring repeatable end results, and we have to do that, and we have to measure and make some hypothesis to make sure we know some modes of action. But to know the complete uh, sequence of interactions and, and, and chemical synthesis or chemical interactions and signaling that make that happen, it's not economically feasible at the company, private company level, and that's what you do all day long in academia. You never get to that end game, but you geek out on the details. Yeah. 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 And well, and that, yeah, all what he was saying tied right back into how effectively the nutrients can make their way into the plant and how effectively, you know, the environment is allowing for photosynthesis to take place between chlorophyll and A and B production and, yeah, yeah carbohydrates and all of that. There's a hundred parameters you have to measure to get a to get a chance at a snapshot of what's right. going on. And you got to remember, if you collect data at day five of a plant growth, and day 10, and day 15, and day 20, you know you have one snapshot at one time of the day, and then things happen on a daily cycle, yep. 
not a weekly cycle. And so there's all these assumptions you have to make, even when you're collecting this ecological data at that level. Yeah. So another random question. If you took a gallon of super happy microbes and put half in a living soil environment and half you put into like synthetic fertilizer, what what's going on with like, are those ones just totally unhappy? So uh, I would say a general statement, absolutely. And they'll tell you why, because they haven't evolved in that environment. You know, if you take microbes directly from soil, we could do this tomorrow. I could go show you how to grow microbes and we'll grow a bunch of them from whatever source you want. I'm an expert at growing microbes and we take them directly from soil and we grow them up pretty quickly. That first growing event, you're gonna lose over 50% of the microbes that existed in that soil because you put them in an environment they haven't been able to evolve into and you have to ease them into any new environment. And so you've knocked out 50%, and this generally, you know, I haven't counted, but I've experienced this before. And so you're only capturing the readily culturable microbes that will grow in two or three day period, not that grow over a 10 day period or not that can't grow well or just got over competed. So you automatically bias that. And then you separate those and we'll grow them up and we put half in a living soil environment and half in a salt, high salt environment. What you're gonna have is a living soil environment that more naturally mimics the soil condition that they're from. And so in general, hypothetically, this is a hypothesis, most of those microbes or much more of those microbes will survive in that soil because that's an environment that mimics their environment that they evolved into initially. The other half, they just got put in a very environmentally stressful environment and you're gonna knock out probably 90% of them. And that's one of the findings that we found when we were culturing microbes and talking to farmers before we started our R&D back at the university. When I heard from a farmer that he loved the idea of using precision microbes like we were hypothesizing creating and that the only way that he was gonna use them because he couldn't make a special trip over his field to apply to the field, too much fuel, too much cost. He couldn't change a thing, so he was gonna take any microbe that I gave him and dump it in a hot fertilizer tank and spread it at the same time. I had an aha moment. I thought, whoa, I don't think microbes can do that. Yeah. And the truth is, most of them can't. So you have to understand, and that's why I love what we've done with Mammoth P. We understood that going into the R&D, not after the fact. And we understood that we needed to evolve microbes to be able to withstand that environment or weed them out through selection before we took them to market, because then they wouldn't be a viable product. And so if that, if that kind of told the story, most microbes can't survive any transplant. Some can, and very, very few can bridge that gap. Yeah. Yeah. I think with the music cranking up, I was like, all right, I think Okay. Time to party now. That was fun, man. Yeah, thank you. Cool.